Raids 3 Tombs of a Masket is finally here, releasing exactly one week from today's video on August 24th. So today we're going to go over everything you need to know prior to release. And we'll go ahead and kick things off with requirements. The requirements to take on the Tombs of a Masket is completion of Beneath Curse Sands. And underneath of that you'll also need Contact, Prince Ali Rescue, Itchlern's Little Helper, and Gertrude's Cat. And in terms of a skill outline you would need in order to complete all of those quests, you would need 62 agility, 55 crafting, and 55 fire making. Now in terms of getting there, Raids 3 is located in the southeastern part of the desert. As you can see, if we pull on this map a little bit, we're all the way down here in Necropolis. This is where the new raid is going to be located. And the two best ways to get there are going to be teleporting via the fairy ring with code AKP. This method will require 62 agility. But the other and probably fastest method to get to Raids 3 is going to be teleporting to Joltavis via the Pharaoh Scepter. And in order to unlock this option on the Pharaoh Scepter, you will need to use your Scepter on the obelisk north of the Necropolis Mine. Now in terms of mechanics and what you can expect within Raids 3, the total amount of players you will be able to take in one single raid as one group will be 8 total players, even though technically you can go in solo. There is going to be two different levels. The upper level will consist of the four initial challenges designed as paths. Each path is associated with one of the bosses along with a challenge section. And one new aspect of Raids 3 is that these can be taken in any order of the player's choice. However, as each path is completed, the raid will change in various ways. Therefore, making which boss you do and in what order, it will completely matter and it will make a difference on the end result of your raid. But regardless of your path and order, once all four have been completed, the lower level becomes accessible. And this lower level will consist of just the final boss fight, which consists of two twin bosses that are fought simultaneously. And only after completing both bosses will you be able to claim your reward. But moving on, we have the Invocation System, which is by far the most unique and interesting aspect of Raids 3. And put simply, the Invocation System will allow you to completely customize your raiding experience. When you first enter the Tombs of a Masket, you'll get the choice to start out with no invocations, which is a little thing we like to call entry mode, or with a set menu of invocations that should result in a challenging and engaging first time experience. You'll be able to view the invocations tab when making or joining a raiding party, and whenever you do pull up the party system, you'll see a picture that looks similar to this, which is essentially a big list of all the invocations selected within this party. And as the party leader, you'll be able to select as many or as few as you like. For each individual invocation you select, it'll add a certain level of difficulty to your raid. With no invocation selected, your raid level will stay at zero. The tougher the invocation, the more raid level it will add. A raid level of zero to 149 will count as an entry mode raid. Entry mode raids are a great way for less experienced raiders to get stuck in and start improving. A raid level of 150 to 299 will count as normal mode. Normal mode guidelines are raids where players with some previous raiding experience will be able to enjoy a challenge and work their way up towards expert mode as they get more comfortable. And a raid with anything over 300 total will count as an expert mode raid. Expert mode is for the best of the best, 300 raid level is all it takes to get there, but there is an option to get all the way up to 580 raid level as of right now. Test your limits and see how far you can go before the power of a mask get overwhelms you. But moving on, fortunately they even gave us ahead of time what we can expect in terms of rewards from each specific level of the raid. All of the untradeable rewards, the threat of Illidanus and the Karis Partisan Jewels can be obtained at any raid level. Therefore, even at zero in the basic entry mode level, both of these untradeable rewards are available. As you work your way up the ranks and surpass a total of 50 raid level, still in entry mode, but you will be able to have a reasonable shot at earning the Lightbearer and the Osmotan Fang. And then completing a raid with at least normal mode difficulty, you will have a chance at all the available uniques, including the Masori Armor, the Ward of Elodinus, or even the Shadow of Temekin. And we don't know at exactly what rate, but the chance to gain a unique item and the quantity of the normal loot you receive is all boosted at higher raid levels. Therefore, even at the most basic normal mode difficulty of 150, you technically have a chance of obtaining all of the uniques. You have a much greater chance the higher you go. Therefore, this means there will always be an incentive to challenge yourself if you want to get your hands on the best possible loot. And speaking of loot, if we slide just a little further, we'll go ahead and touch on all of the available rewards within Raids 3. And first up, we have the Masori Armor, soon to be the best in-slot ranged armor when upgraded using Armadil, which will require 80 defense and 80 range. 
Then next up we have the Shadow of Temekin, which is the brand new mage weapon requiring 85 magic. And similar to other powered stabs, the Shadow of Temekin will have a built-in spell which charges powered by soul runes and chaos runes. Originally this staff will have an attack rate of 5 cycles and can only be used in PVM. But on top of its basic spell, the staff will also come with two passive effects. First is the magic strength from gear is tripled. This will be capped at a total of 100% magic strength. But on top of that, your magic accuracy from your gear is also tripled. Do note though that these passive effects only apply when used with the built-in spell and won't impact bonuses applied to spells from any other spellbook. Then next up we have the Ward of Eladinus, which will require 80 magic, 80 defense, and 80 prayer. And it will soon be the best in slot magic offhand. You'll receive the Broken Ward as a rare loot from the Tombs of Masket, and using 90 prayer and 90 smithing you'll be able to combine it with an arcane sigil and 10,000 soul runes to repair it. Then next up we have the Osmotan's Fang which will require 80 to attack and is a brand new 5 cycle stab weapon. This weapon will be decent against low defense NPCs but it will excel against monsters with a high defense. And they do note that it does do full damage to court beasts similar to spears. And then next up for uniques we have the light bearer which is a brand new ring and when equipped it will double the rate at which your special attack energy regenerates. And then we have the threat of Eladinus which is one of the few untradeable rewards requiring 75 crafting and when used with the rune pouch it will add an additional rune slot available. Therefore instead of being able to store three different unique types of runes in your rune pouch once upgraded you will be able to store a total of four different types. And then finally, to end off rewards, we have the Karis Partisan Jewels, the other few untradeable uniques from Tombs of a Masket. There are three total jewels you can get for the Karis Partisan, although only one of which you can use outside the Tombs of a Masket, and this is the Breach of the Scarab. This jewel increases accuracy by 33% against Calphites, Scarabs, and Beetles. But for the next two, we have the Eye of the Corruptor and the Jewel of the Sun, both of which can only be used within Raids 3. Now for the Eye of the Corruptor, using this jewel grants the Karis Partisan a brand new special attack, the Wraith of a Masket, which costs 75% of your special attack energy, but the Wraith of a Masket has a 100% increased accuracy and 25% increased damage. Any enemy hit by the Wraith of a Masket will receive 25% increased damage for the next 6 seconds, and in addition to that, the Karis Partisan's attack speed will be halved when using Wraith of a Masket. In other words, you'll have to wait 8 cycles after using this special attack weapon to be able to start attacking again. And then for the second jewel you can use within Raids 3 only, we have the Jewel of the Sun. Using this jewel grants the Karis Partisan a passive ability to drain life from defeated enemies at a cost of prayer points. If a killing blow is dealt to a creature within the Tombs of a Masket with the Karis Partisan sporting a Jewel of the Sun, the player will lose 5 prayer points but gain 12 HP. This effect can overheal up to 20% over the player's max hit points. In addition, the Jewel of the Sun gives the Karis Partisan plus 25% accuracy against creatures with less than 25% health. And when using the Jewel of the Sun, the Jewel grants a different special attack, the Tomekin's Light. But when used, the Tomekin's Light costs 75% of your special attack energy and takes 50 of your prayer points, but it will fully heal you and overheal you 20% over your hit points level, and this special attack also cures all poison and restores any drain stats and fully restores your run energy. And before we end off this video, I do want to throw a short clip in here from yesterday's video that Old School just released, which gave a really decent first look at what Raids 3 looks like, including some of the boss's mechanics and their attacks. Baba is the guardian of Atmanken, and in keeping with Atmanken's alignment of companionship, Baba comes with a huge family of baboons. To reach Baba herself, you'll first have to fight through these baboons. But be careful, because there's going to be some interesting dangers along the way. The Guardian of Krondis is Zebak, and in keeping with Krondis' alignment, you'll need to use your resourcefulness to overcome some deadly traps before reaching him. Akka is the Guardian of Het. <laughs> That's it. That's all we got. <laughs> Het is the God of Strength, and to overcome his Guardian, Akka, you'll need to turn his own strengths against him. I look upon you with pity. Realistically, we didn't get a lot, and obviously I would not take into account whatsoever what gear they are wearing in these videos. Obviously, if you've been on Reddit at all recently, you've known that there were some leaked pictures and images from the trailers and things of such, where there are basically pictures of people wearing specific gear or doing things a certain way. And obviously, we've always been trolled in the past, considering there were things like 
in the initial release for Zora, they were wearing melee gear and whatnot, even though Zora was immune to melee. But that's enough rambling, and regardless, you take that factor out of account, we can go ahead and look at some of these clips right here, where basically it does show us a few seconds of the clips, where you can see right there, there's a little poison trap in Zebok's room. Obviously something similar to maybe Soda's Egg, where there's some kind of path we do have to run on. Then there's also this little farming patch, which has a health bar and getting healed or killed by 25 damage. Something to do with this plant, which will be one of the challenge rooms for one of these specific bosses. And they also included in Baba's room, obviously we do have to kill a ton of baboons. Something I assume is very similar to that of crabs within Raids 2. But I imagine there's also a twist to that because there are some boxes around the room, one of which contains like hammers. There's also looks to be some potions in the top right. But in the most simplified versions, there does appear to be blue, red, and green very easily comparing to that of mage melee and range so that part would be the most realistic outside of what other future changes and twists they do add but if we jump a little further through the clip we get to this room we can see there is like a little mining down a wall area section of this challenge so mining will be needed in some type of capacity and you can see that aka actually is protecting from both melee and range Therefore, Mage is going to be the go-to use for killing this boss, at least in whatever phase of the fight this is. And then playing these final few seconds, you can see the boss fight rooms of at least three of the four total bosses, along with some potential special attacks and mechanics. Some like walling off fire with tiny little scarabs in Kafri's room. And then moving on, we go over to Baba, where we can see the boss fights kind of like up a hill. And then finally we finish with Zebak, and you can see a special attack where he's kind of throwing an eye along with a bunch of little like poison splats around the area. Either way, those are just a few small things I noticed in that video they just released yesterday. So at the very least, I wanted to include a short clip highlighting some of the stuff I noticed. I'm sure there was also plenty of things I missed, so I will include that video linked down in the description below if you haven't checked it out already. And feel free to drop a comment on anything that I didn't include from that video that you noticed or other potential mechanics that you recognize that I happened to miss and didn't include. Either way, apart from that, that is absolutely everything you need to know that's been confirmed about Tombs of a Masket. I hope you guys are as excited for Rage 3 as I am. We are only one week away exactly from today's video. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video or found it helpful, and if you did, consider dropping the like, it massively helps it out. And if you're not already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you're notified every time a new video goes live. Either way, I'll catch you guys soon in the next video.